You ever wish you could take a road trip and see the most amazing teaching you could? Well, our next guest did. Thank you, Hewell Hauser. Oh, that wasn't my Hewell Hauser, Tim. Oh, that was it? No. California's gold. I'm Hewell Hauser. That's not even, that's horrible. It's Friday. I'm tired, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Scott. Well, we have a special guest on the show today, a repeat visitor, a repeat guest of our show, and that's David Cohn. He is the author of Capturing the Spark, Inspired Teaching, Thriving Schools. He took a trip around the state of California a couple of years ago and went into classrooms and saw what was going on, and he wrote a book about it. So we're going to talk to him today about what that was like. Uh, also, David is a high school English teacher in beautiful and very friendly Palo Alto, California, where he teaches uh, yeah, English, high school English. Right, David? That's right, yep. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us on the Bedley Brothers. Uh, a, a pleasure to be back in this format and uh, to be in conversation with you guys again, uh, you know, knowing that it's, it's fun whether it's online or not. Uh, amen to that, right? So uh, get, just get us started and uh, tell us, tell our listeners that are not familiar with you and your book, uh, what it all, I mean, I gave kind of a brief synopsis, but sure. what's it all about? Well, uh, the origins of it are just in my own curiosity about the profession. And I was never really, it was, I guess, it, like teaching is enough of a challenge just in your own classroom, but I always had an interest in the bigger picture, the forces that were shaping teaching and public education. And I got involved in different kinds of leadership projects and opportunities and online communities. And I got very curious about what was happening in places that were completely unlike my own uh, teaching setting. And I actually, before thinking about California, I had like got on Google Maps for fun one night and I mapped out a journey around the country. Um, and I really wanted to go see my friend Renee Moore, uh, who teaches in Cleveland, Mississippi. And could, you know, from what I knew about her and, and about their community, just she seems like someone with whom I would have nothing in common except the fact that we both love teaching English and love high schools and love talking about education. Mississippi, well, on the way, hey, I know someone in Arizona, so I'll stop in Arizona. And then, oh, Florida. And, you know, that was really a big fantasy to think I'd get all around the country. Uh, so I scaled it down to people that I had uh, encountered through various work I had done in California. And I kept thinking about it actually for a couple of years. And it um, kind of planted the idea and my wife didn't quite believe me. So she said, yeah, I could support that idea. And then, you know, <laughs> I came back to it. And she's like, oh, I said I'd support that, didn't I? And uh, so <laughs> Yeah, once my family was on board, it was a matter of um, taking a leave of absence from my school and uh, the school and district were very supportive and then uh, raising some money and then calling up all my friends and uh, and then getting some referrals. And ultimately, I went to 50 different cities and towns around California and not all in one trip. And um, I... When I was on about 70 campuses altogether and probably uh, spoke with or observed uh, about 100 teachers overall. Um, but most of them were actually, I would spend one full day with one teacher. Uh, so there are a few times where I might have met six teachers in a day uh, or seven, and, and that really would kind of inflate the number. Usually it was just I would get to school when the teacher gets there. and um, stay for the day and just sort of be their shadow. David, so when you were like imagining the audience that you were writing this book for, did you picture this being for the classroom teacher, the administrator that, you know, maybe doesn't get to get out and see what other teachings happening around the state? Uh, who, who was your audience when you were originally imagining this book? Well, I, there's kind of two answers to that. I, Hang on one second. Uh, there's something happening audio wise. I'm going to edit this part out. Uh, your device or something, I think, David, I don't know if something's hitting it or whatever, but every once in a while, you like, does this noise. So just be aware of that um, when you're, because I, I don't want to have a messy audio signal. Something, something's 
funky is happening every once in a while. Okay. Sounds uh, like something brushing against the mic or something like that, right? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to stop talking for a second. We'll leave a little pause in there for editing purposes, and then you can start answering some of that question, okay? John, edit here. So I think there are two answers to the reader I had in mind for the audience. One was just sort of knowing the most likely readers were going to be teachers, uh, because that's who I'm connected with and who I know. And, and I knew that there would be an interest among teachers uh, in the book. But as I was writing, I really did want to avoid um, jargon and avoid writing as if the reader knows all about teaching and schools. Um, so I, my, I, I was hoping the audience would be broader than just educators and would also include parents and others, uh, community members who have a general interest in public education too. You know, but that's, uh, that's sort of the reach audience in a sense, the built in audience was educators. So let's get to the juicy stuff here. What did you <laughs> suggest? You were like, "Ooh, this is cool." Well, there's so many things, and to, you know, it, it there are definitely places where I could talk about the wow factor um, in you know watching, uh, seeing some of the technology and the the really cool heart dissections happening in a science classroom, and you know, like cows' hearts, you know, and it's like. And kids are sort of going, ew, and then at the same time, they're totally into it and they're really learning science and, and so hands-on and and you know, the 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 feeling, the textures of the learning, the smells, you know, and yeah, that's sometimes what what's something good. About that. Oh yeah. <laughs> so um and then, you know, another highlight was getting to visit Design 39 campus in Poway in their first year of operation and and seeing some of the creative things that they're doing and really and it wasn't just that they're doing creating these opportunities for students to follow their passions and whether it's something like technology uh you know engineering design kinds of things or just follow their passion for paper mache and chess and doing speech and debate kinds of things so it, those things are all very exciting, but at the same time, I wanted to put right on the same level, uh, the excitement of just watching an exceptionally talented and compassionate teacher who sometimes it just takes a certain kind of near heroism to, to get through a day under really challenging circumstances. And, um, and I wanted to make sure that there were uh, examples of that as well. People who are just um, bringing everything they have to their kids, and there may not be, at least you know, on the day that I was visiting, something that's going to you know make Twitter light up with oohs and ahs and uh, you know fascination and like, oh, I'm going to totally borrow that. You know, sometimes these are things you can't borrow, but I think we need to sort of take our hats off to uh, appreciate. Um, what it takes to just sort of be fully present for kids and to love them all, um, no matter what they bring to the classroom that day. Give us like something specific that you saw, like an exact story or a teacher or a classroom or something like that. Sure. Well, I, you know, um, my friend Martha Infante teaches at Los Angeles Academy Middle School in Los Angeles Unified School District. And, you know, it's a district and a community that has faced so many challenges and, you know, the, um, you know, on a, on the day that I visited, I saw a variety of different middle school social studies classes. And, you know, sometimes you just reach the end of the day with middle schoolers and, uh, you know, they, they arrive, it's like two 30, they have to get through that last class. And, and there's a lot going on in their lives. You know, we have so many, uh, students who are not getting the, the kinds of supports that they need um, wherever at school at home uh, in the community and th there was just this kind of brewing tension between some of the students in her class and there were moments along the way where 
I think any experienced teacher watching it would have said, okay, that was the last straw. You got to, you have to send that kid out, send that, you know, and it, it wasn't total chaos. It was just, you know, sort of like watching this tension, sort of like, you know, watching this string vibrate, wondering if it's going to snap. And she did eventually send one of the kids out. Um, but it was the way she went to the other student who was involved in, in some problems that I describe in the book and talk to him about everything he did right. And all the, all the times when, you know, at some point she could have, he could have been on the receiving end of some discipline and he ended up on the receiving end of not only praise, but a kind of metacognitive process where she was talking to him about what did you do right today? What was it that allowed you to keep things under control for yourself enough? You know, it maybe wasn't perfect, but trying to engage him in thinking about how he had done right. And, you know, when we think about, you know, sometimes we talk about the, um, the, the consequences for uh, kids in disciplinary uh, ways where they sort of, they start down a path and things start unraveling for them. And they're sort of tumbling through with referrals and suspensions and where that, where that pathway leads statistically um, all too often. And, you know, it was one day, I don't know what happened after that, but on that day, she made some decisions that could make a positive difference for him and help him understand what he was doing to help make that happen. And, you know, so we, we talk a lot about mindset and trying to make students aware of how they're learning and what their processes are and how they improve. And, and this was sort of mindset kind of thinking about taking care of yourself and managing yourself and, and hanging in there. And, um, and I think for her to stay in control in that situation. And, and when I wrote about it, I think I called it, you know, the, she was the perfect person to, for some very imperfect circumstances. And, and I, I like to put that right out there with, you know, the really cool virtual reality and technology and uh, you know, all sorts of interesting, innovative kinds of things that might be in the book as well. Hey, David, was there, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of common threads people will talk about. They see running through quality teacher classrooms. Uh, did you, identify those same kind of threads? Were there any other threads that stuck out to you that you might have been able to pull together in this process? Sure. Well, I, I, I think the main one for the book overall is the idea that people thrive when they have a chance to build on their strengths and to be their authentic selves. And some people are um, really extroverted and uh, larger than life and enjoy uh, the show, enjoy putting on the show. And, and I think those of us who've had teachers like that, you, you, you want to go to their class and it's fun and engaging. And um, you know, I think of like Catlin Tucker um, at Windsor High School reading story, you know, doing story time with her kids. And she reads and, you know, the importance of reading aloud to students is, uh, is, uh, I think we we can really model our passion for literature and literacy uh, by reading aloud. And she care, you know, that's often talked about more with younger kids. And she does it with high school students, but she does it with sometimes with little kids' books, you know. And and to and it kind of brings the the high school kids and middle school kids. You know, a lot of times they're they're kind of like that uh, opportunity to you know, get back in touch with their younger selves sometimes. Like they still like stickers, you know, they still they still get excited about smelly markers sometimes, even in high school. And so Catelyn's really in touch with that. And that works for her personality. But I wouldn't want to see anybody, you know, then come along and say, you know, okay, all high school teachers are going to read kids' books to their students once a week, you know, read do read aloud time. Because that that's her personality and her passion. Um, I would be okay if it was the giving tree. Uh-huh. Sure. <laughs> I mean, we've all got our favorites, right? And 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 that's great. Um and some people are really into I think what I would say is you know, so one key thread is that when someone really knows what they're into and what suits their personality and they can work that way, 
uh, and they have a school and a community and leadership and colleagues and who are supportive of that, um, then they not only can do their best teaching, but in a way they're modeling for students what it is to learn, what it is to follow your passion, what it is to find uh, your own creative approach. And yet at the same time, I'm not talking about total free agency here where everyone just teaches whatever they want. Um, you have to be intellectually curious at, enough and humble enough in a way to admit when you need to change, when you need to shift, when you need to try new practices or abandon old practices that aren't working anymore. So I'm not saying everyone do what you want, but everyone has to have some opportunity to build on uh, what works for them and be true to their personality. You know, um, David, like when you're saying this, it makes me think about how they match student teachers um, <laughs> with their teacher that's going to be mentoring through the process. And I, I, I wish that they would take this idea that you're talking about and try to match student teachers with people that may, may match up a little bit more closely with, with that, um, that style, that personality style. And they could see somebody that may be a little similar personality style and how they approach the classroom rather than somebody that may be completely opposite and you wouldn't even do anything like that person. Um, yeah, I, I don't mean, know, Tim, what do, you, what do you think about that? Like, would that oh, have an impact? Yeah, that's. I think that's a fantastic idea. And at the same time, though, um, I think as if you're matched with someone who isn't similar to you in style, as long as they, if you can reach some common agreement that it's not important to have the same style, then that would be okay. I mean, it's it's tricky because when you're new, uh, a lot of it is imitation. A lot of it is. Uh, you're, you're kind of in this moment where you need to grab onto something and maybe you do grab onto something that isn't a perfect fit because that's what's nearby. That's what's been patterned or demonstrated for you. Uh, but at the same time, I when I remember my student teaching, I actually had a mentor who was, I had no official connection with her. Um, she was just another teacher in the department where I was student teaching, but she always invited me to come observe her lessons and this was, you know, super traditional, old school, um, you know, just she would either lecture or there would be small group discussions. And there weren't a ton of, and, you know, this is like early, early internet back when the World Wide Web had like a thousand web pages or something. And, <laughs> and, you know, was that the first week of the internet? <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, so, but the key thing with her was that uh, her name was Jean Johnson. This was at Cupertino High School in 1994, 95. But she always asked me, what do you think? And what, what, how would you do this lesson differently? And did you think the students were responding? She never told me how to teach anything. She always asked what I thought. And she was authentically interested in my perspective and my feedback. And so even if our styles might have been different, what she was showing me was that you need to keep asking yourself. You need to keep testing your thinking and your theories about what works and always look for improvement. And, you know, she was a veteran teacher um, and a pretty effective one from what I could see. Well, well, David, I'm David. I'm yes, yes. Back, back. I think it's coming through David's now. Yeah. I had phones on, so. Yeah. Um, okay, it stopped. So David, uh, I'm sure that some of our listeners are going to be real interested in getting your book after getting a little taste of it from listening to you. And I understand that you're going to give our listeners a special code later on in the show where they can download your book at a big discount, a 33% discount for your book. So we appreciate you doing that. But right now we're going to switch gears with you and play a little game if you don't mind. So. <laughs> A little scary because I don't really know what I'm in for, but oh, we never tell our. Oh, guests. you're you're in for it, David. You're in for it. <laughs> All right. So, David, you're the author of "Capturing the Spark: Inspired Teaching in Thriving Schools," and as as we know, you uh, to write the book, you spent a year traveling around the state of California visiting schools. Um, we're thinking that maybe you probably didn't visit too many other places besides schools. I mean, if you went on a hundred campuses or something, uh, you were. Uh, a very busy person, but 
maybe you did get to see some of the more interesting sites of California. So um, today we're going to play a little game with you that we're calling Capturing California. Scott, tell our audience who David will be competing for today. David, you'll be competing for? Well, David, who will you be competing for? Um, I'm going to do this uh, in honor of a teacher who is uh, right down in your neck of the woods. I was trying to think of someone um, to recognize. And uh, so I, the teacher is going to be Tiffany Coates from uh, Live Oak Elementary School in Fallbrook. That is awesome. And David, if you're able to answer two out of three questions correctly, Tiffany Coates of Fallbrook, California will be awarded a free download of an album by the ridiculously popular edger rock band Rockin' the Standards. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Scott. So, David, here we go with your first question. We're going to be asking you some questions about uh, some rather odd and interesting sites around California that we're really hoping that you got to see in your travels. Have you watched okay. California's Gold with Huel Hauser? I don't think so. Oh, bummer. Uh-oh. That probably would have helped you on this. No Googling, right, Tim? No Googling. Hands off the uh, keyboard. Okay. Shocking as it may seem, Pasadena is home to hundreds of parrots. Did you get a chance to visit the parrots of Pasadena, David? I did not. I did visit a school in Pasadena. Oh, well, did you see any parrots flying around? I don't think so. It was uh, <laughs> Cleveland Elementary School. It was actually the first school I visited where I actually had to travel to get there. Okay, okay. Well, there are several different explanations as to the origins of these out-of-place birds. Which of these is not, I said not, one of the those explanations? Is it A, they escaped from a 1969 fire at Simpson's Nursery in East Pasadena on East Colorado Boulevard. Or is it B? They were originally black market birds released by smugglers. Or is it C? They were released from the defunct Pasadena City Zoo back in the 1950s when the zoo ended up with too many of the birds because of a very active breeding season. All right, so one of those is two of them actually are an explanation of where the parrots came from. One of them is not. You're trying to identify the one that's not. So is it uh, the escaping from the fire? Is it the black market birds that were released? Or is it the uh, the zoo that had just too many birds uh, that they... Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my trust in... <laughs> I'm going to put my trust in the in the good people who who ran the zoo and hoped that they would do the right thing and not just, you know, throw open the aviaries and let them fly. So I'm going to try C. Well, guess what? I'm glad Woo! the zoo people, yes, they would not do something as terrible as that. So uh, the other two were true that uh, at least that's what people say happened, is that there was a fire that they escaped from and, it, uh, they're, they're from like the Amazon or something. These birds are, they're very rare. Oh, Tim, we have flocks like flying around Irvine. Like, they're just all over. Parrots? Yeah, it's crazy. Oh my goodness, we don't have any parrots out here. Okay, in, unless they're in a is, cave. Is flock the correct term with the parrot? Or do they have some other kind of a term? Because I know like crows are like, there's a murder of crows, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, I can't answer that question. Maybe we'll put, we'll put that one in the next show. Okay, so David, you'd... Did you make it to Oakland during your California tour? I did. Yeah. Brook okay. Brookfield Elementary School. Well, I, I'm not sure if you noticed this when you were in Oakland, but beginning in 2012, an anonymous artist began a mission to make residents and visitors like yourself of the city a little merrier. Which of these random acts did the anonymous artist do? Is it A, he painted gnomes on six-inch wooden blocks and screwed them onto utility poles. Is it B? He carved pumpkins and in, with inspiring messages and left the pieces of art on the BART trains. That would be art on BART. Okay, and then, or is it C? <laughs> he turned graffiti into colorful pictures of birds. 
We've got a bird theme running through this one. <laughs> okay, so your choices are the gnomes on the wood blocks, the carved pumps, pumpkins on the BART trains, or graffiti that was turned into birds. There was somebody that was doing this just randomly to cheer everyone up. And I yeah. guess Bill does it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I, I live, you know, almost, you know, it's like just 40 miles away. I'm trying to rack my brain to see if I remember any of this, but uh, I honestly, I, the pumpkins doesn't sound nice. Uh, and it wouldn't be limited to Oakland because the trains just pass through Oakland and go elsewhere. So I'm going to eliminate that one. Um, and since birds and option C were both good to me uh, last time, I'm going to stick with option C. All right. So actually, that's the wrong answer. He actually painted gnomes on six inch wooden blocks and screws them on utility poles. <laughs> That's Is that pretty, public property? That's pretty bizarre. <laughs> All right. Well, here's here comes question number three. Another strange stop you probably should have made time for, but probably didn't, is Elmer's Bottle Tree Ranch. Have you heard of this? Nope. Doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> this is where you can see trees, <laughs> not really trees, trees made of junk. They're... Uh, Bottles, water bottles and stuff stuck out as the limbs and the leaves. Which California highway would you be driving on if you were ha to happen upon this very historic landmark? Is it A? Highway 49 in the historic gold mining area. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was nice. I went up on that last inflection. Yeah. Just to yeah. Or is it B? Route 66, the nostalgic highway in Southern California where you can get your kicks. En route. En route. Okay. Or is it uh, C? The I-5 in Central California, a long stretch of mindless highway. This is like the Californian on uh, Saturday Night Live, Tim. It's like, how do you get there? You take the 57 to the 44 and get off on the 91. You take the 91 to the 57. <laughs> All right. So your choices are the Highway 49, which is somewhat close to you, I think. Uh, yeah. Route 66, and then I, the I-5, which you're on, are you on the 99 or the 5? You're on the 5, aren't you? Uh, well, we're pretty far inland from there, but yeah, 5 is closer. But I'm, for, it's going to take an hour to an hour and a half for me to get to Highway 5. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So um, which of these highways would you be driving on to visit Elmer's Bottle Tree Ranch? Okay, so yeah, so 49 is up, but uh, yeah, it is near Gold Country. I think it goes in or near Grass Valley, and I did visit um, Scotton Elementary School in Grass Valley. Okay, so you're on Highway 49, all right. Close, no recollection of any, uh, you yeah. uh, what is it, Elmer's? Elmer's Bottle Tree Ranch. Tree ranch, yeah, and ranch doesn't sound like that area anyway. And five highway five, yeah. There is there anything interesting on highway five <laughs> <laughs> in between Sacramento and Los Angeles? So I don't know. Um, so uh, but you know, since highway 66 is so full of myth and lore and uh, story and history, um. And I, I can't remember if I hit any part of that. I did drive between San Diego and El Centro, but I think I was on bigger interstates there. But um, yeah, I just it, it's hard to hear Highway 66 and not go for it. And not think of Elmer's bottle. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> and guess what? You're right. Good job, David. Okay, so Scott, how did uh, David do on today's game? David, you got two out of three correct, and that's good enough to be a winner. All right. Congratulations, David. You won absolutely nothing. <laughs> but Tiffany Coates and Fallbrook, she just won a free download of the ridiculously, specially awesomeness, amazingness of rocking the standards, standards-based music to help your kids from six down to second grades, and the teachers who speak in improper English like I. So, uh, 
David, thanks for being a good sport. And uh, we're going to wrap things up here with you by getting what that code is and also any uh, websites, uh, Twitter handles, or anything that our listeners can follow up with. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that opportunity. So the uh, let's get to the, the main thing here, uh, the coupon. So this is, I can't do much about um, the price of the paperback if people buy that. Uh, you know, you can find it at uh, your usual online vendors, and you can also support your local bookstores, and uh, they probably won't have it on the shelves, but they can special order it for you. Um, and they might be interested in giving you a discount, but I can't control that. Um, but I can do a discount on the EPUB format if you want to download it from smashwords.com. And uh, then you can read it on an iPad or other uh, tablet or device. And um, the nice thing about that, I, I kind of prefer reading paperbacks, but I had so much fun putting together the EPUB version because it has in the neighborhood of 50 color pictures from the classrooms and schools I visited. And that made the project a lot more fun. Uh, the paperback has 15 black and white pictures. So uh, the electronic format is, uh, I think it's nice for this book. Uh, it's usually $9.99, but you can get it for one third off. This is at smashwords.com. The title of course is Capturing the Spark, Inspired Teaching, Thriving Schools. And just do a search there. It won't be hard to find. And the coupon code is TS79R. And that is not case sensitive. So TS79R. You can learn more about the book at capturingthespark.com. And you can find me on Twitter at Cohen D. C O H E N D. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing all that great uh, information with us. And I'm sure our listeners are going to run out and get the book and, uh, you know, maybe get the, the digital version with that coupon code. So thanks for offering that to our, uh, our audience. And well, yeah, thank you very much for the chance to talk with you again. Uh, uh, always a pleasure. And I really appreciate what you guys do to bring information and enthusiasm uh, to teaching and teachers. Thank and you, David. kids. Of course, <laughs> that's who it's really for, right? Right on, absolutely. And uh, thanks everyone for listening to the show again today. If you like the show, go to iTunes and write us a review. We'd really appreciate that. That's how we build our audience. But mostly, we want to thank mom and dad. Thank you, mom and dad. Thanks, mom and dad, for watching the show and listening. <laughs> Check out Global School Play Day. Play.